I'll just do a super quick little intro here. Um, my name is Diane Gettle. I'm the executive editor here at Black Lawrence Press, and I'm joined um, by Abayomi Animashan, who is our uh, anthologies editor and uh, the, the brains and the heart behind Far Villages, which is what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, and it's just an absolute delight to be here. Um, I am so glad that so many people are interested in the topics that we have covered in many of these uh, Zoom events. Tonight specifically, we are talking about publishing and the literary community. Um, and <coughs> it's wonderful to have this event because we are engaging in the literary community um, here from all all corners. Um, and I will say, you know, there have been so many terrible things about this pandemic, but one thing that's been wonderful have been these events that we've put together. Usually when we have an anthology, um, we try and say, okay, well, we've got, you know, five contributors in Chicago and two in Nashville and three in San Francisco. And we try and do these little pocket events around the country. And those are fun and they're great. Um, but this way we all get to join from wherever we are. We've had people join us from overseas. We've had had um, somebody that's been joining us regularly from Bangladesh. Um, and so oh. it's been really wonderful <clears throat> to get the word out about this fantastic anthology, which again is, you know, su such a, uh, the, the, it's a book of welcoming. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to sort of broadcast this um, internationally even. Um, so so tonight um, we are uh, going to be discussing specifically um, uh, what it takes to publish single poems or a whole book, why being rejected can be good, and when to reject rejection. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin by introducing tonight's poet essayists who will discuss their contributions to the anthology. And as these panelists are speaking, please feel free to drop questions or comments in the chat box at any time. And then we'll use your notes in our open conversation at the end of, uh, of the presentations when we'll all sort of jump in and just hopefully have a fun and engaging conversation. Um, yeah, so does anybody specifically really like to go first? Or does anyone have jitters and they want to get it over with? <laughs> I'll go first. I, I could hear that, but I couldn't see who was talking. Was that you, Linda? No, oh. that's Helen Ruggieri. Oh, okay. Oh. That was Helen. So Helen, let's see if we can start. I like to get it over with. <laughs> oh, there you are, Helen. <laughs> there we go. I think that your, your video was off. So, okay, I will start start by introducing Helen, um, who has a really, really perfect bio specifically for tonight. Um, <laughs> Helen Ruggieri has had work in over a hundred magazines and anthologies. She has been rejected by more than a hundred others. <laughs> Welcome, Helen, and thank you so much for, uh, for joining us tonight and talking about um, your essay in this wonderful anthology. Take it away. Well, thank you. I'm not sure that this is for uh, peers, more for beginning people who haven't been subjected to rejection after rejection after rejection. Uh, but I think it's good to know, people call poets sensitive. Uh -uh. They have the toughest skin <laughs> in the world. They've taken more S dash 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 T than any other profession. It starts out in grade school when people make fun of you in the playground. It gets worse in high school. When you're in college, you know enough to shut up about it. And then you don't mention it for 10 years while you struggle to get that first publication. I was getting insulted by somebody. This was like one of the high points in my life. I worked in a library and I got free tuition at a college because I got free tuition for, I was working on my master's and someone said, oh, you're never gonna do anything. And I just put a copy of the English journal with my first published poem up on the stacks. So I just went over and picked it up and da da da. That was so great. <laughs> that was an acceptance though, it wasn't a rejection. So at first it was easy. I got a whole bunch of acceptances in my first year of send out. And then I went two years, two years, two very long years before I got 
and another acceptance. So I guess persistence is the one thing that poets have to have. Um, and for starters, younger starting out, well, you have to come to terms with it or you might as well just get out of the Poe business. Um, there's an adage that's, what is it, read, and, read it and weep, <laughs> that refers to rejection letters. Um, they used to be letters, but now we've gone to email. Uh, so you don't have to run and check your mailbox, befriending the uh, mailman or mail woman as they have now. Uh, but if you need, if you want to publish and get like a, a, pay, a place, and even if it's in the basement of the poetry world, you have to submit, unless you have friends in high places. Uh, and then you're a rejectee, but have faith. Anne Frank's journal, 15 times it was rejected. The help, 60 times. I think everybody knows this one. Stephen King's first novel, Carrie, was rejected 30 times. Wow. J.K. Rowling's first Harry Potter novel was rejected 12 times. And an editor, I love this, told her to keep her day job. <laughs> Whoa. I don't know why some editors can't wait to just get that knife in and twist it a little bit. Um, I got a beauty recently and I'm pretty thick skinned now. I, I, I hardly pay attention. I can't remember where I sent things I'm getting at that age. Uh, this pulled my chain though. Keep at it. You'll get there with a little smiley face. I'm pretty damn old. <laughs> I have much longer to keep at it, but what the hell. Anyway, what you can do though now is just delete. So in a way you take the moral high ground and that's a good way to face rejection. Uh, it keeps your ego intact. You can make fun of the magazine and the stuff they print. Oh my good Lord, that's awful. Have you read poetry lately? What are they doing? Who's the idiot in charge? Uh, you can develop that thick skin, believe in yourself, persist, or you can even revision your work to look at it again. Maybe you've missed something. You can get rejected for business readings, nothing personal. Sorry, we don't use blah, 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 whatever you sent. We did one like this last year. We're filled into 20, we're filled until 2025. So you should market your work more carefully. Don't send sci-fi to lit mags. Persist, revise, resend. But I categorized rejection notes. There's the standard printer, same old, same old. Sorry, but we cannot use the enclosed material. Thank you for sending, blah, blah, blah. There's the reverse rejections, sales pitch, a con, so to speak, close to a sales pitch. They're out of the way insults. And now I've noticed an alarming trend of rejection notes that are excessively sorry. We're so sorry. I'm going to read a little bit from my essay here. Um, the reverse rejection. They begin with sad tales about the millions of envelopes pouring into their tiny office, their unpaid staff who do this for the love of literature, the rising printing costs, the times, the state of the art, etc. You're not likely to feel sympathy for a magazine has just told you you cannot use the enclosed material. Some magazines try to combine rejection with the sales pitch. 
Perhaps the sample issue will help you to decide which poems to send. I like this one. I used it myself during a brief stint as an editor, a, a rejector. Oh my God, I went to the other side. Of course, I was rejected by the rejectees. My favorite flattering rejection letter begins, your manuscript has been rejected, but we like your style and insist on you sending us more. Several paragraphs further down is the hook. Submissions must be accompanied with a $10 reading fee. No, thank you. I'll take my rejection straight up. Some are perfectly insulting. You have to hand it to editors. It takes daring and imagination and a head full of conceit. There's no room for additional opinions. These rejectors are at the top of the class. They write letters you can revel in. You have been firmly put in your place by a master. These rejection notes become collector's items. Thank you for submission, but the judges feel you are not making a contribution to American letters. Oh, whimper, whimper. It's hard to maintain standards these days. Many rejectors of late are so neutral, it's hard to find anything worth getting riled up about. Some editors will scribble little notes at the bottom though. My personal favorite came from a magazine asking for new and interesting work. And at the bottom, the editor had chosen to write nothing new or interesting here. Ooh, wow, it's good for your blood pressure. Lately, there's an alarming trend in rejection letters, excessive sorriness. I want to reassure, the, reassure them, don't be that sorry. I send out regularly, alphabetically, systematically. You're one magazine on a long list. That doesn't mean you're not making contributions to American letters, but never reply that gets you into a bad area. With the advent of emails, you're lucky if you get a response at all. People say, oh, check our web page. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, but my favorite online one had in the two line of the email, all the rejectees with their full names and emails. Ooh, 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 who did that? But that's, that's a classic is I used to send to places just because they had a wonderful, I'd heard they had wonderful rejection notes. I sent to Mad Magazine, you know, they're not gonna print a poem, but I got a full eight by 11 of Alfred E. Newman giving me the finger. I and mean, you can't beat that. <laughs> Some others are Kayak, which is an old magazine in the seventies had a, a man with his head in a vice. It's hard to, you know, hold a grudge when you get a laugh out of a rejection note. But in the course of 20 years of sending out, or maybe more, I had over a pound and then I decided <laughs> it was taking up too much room. So I had a, a, a bonfire, a pyre, if you will, and burned them all. And I don't even keep them now. Um, other than to keep track of where they where my uh, work has been. But my advice to beginners, reject rejection. Find better things to worry about. There's tons of things out there you can do nothing about, you know, global warming, ISIS, quantum entanglement, whatever that is. Worry about something big. Don't worry about rejection. That's about my career in a, <laughs> in a short summary. But thank you much for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? I know you want to see my Alfred E. Newman rejection. I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> so um, Helen, we're going to do uh, questions kind of as a big constellation at the end, once once every all the panelists. Oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. and. 
I have to say, reading the essays in this uh, in this part of the anthology have been incredibly useful to me as an editor. <laughs> um, I certainly don't send anybody rejection letters with you know a cartoon character holding up the finger. Um, <laughs> as, uh, we we have some people here tonight, including Abayo and Nancy, that have books with Black Lawrence Press, and I hope they can both attest to the fact that we, we try to be really nice. <laughs> we really do. We, we, <laughs> Don't we, be we, too we, nice. <laughs> we work hard at it. Um, but it, it, is, it is a very, it's a very fine line, isn't it, Helen, between being overly sorry and Alfred E. Newman with a finger. <laughs> There's right, right. something in between those. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. And again, if anybody does have questions, go ahead and drop them right in the chat box and we'll review everything at the end. Um, next up, we have Katie Manning tonight. Um, Katie is the founding editor in chief of Whale Road Review and an associate professor of writing at Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego. She is the author of Tasty Other, which won the 2016 Main Street Rag Poetry Book Award. Congratulations and four chapbooks, including The Gospel of the Bleeding Woman. Her poems have appeared in the American Journal of Nursing, New Letters, Poet Lore, Stirring Thrush, Verse Daily, and many other journals and anthologies. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. So I feel like following Helen, I should just share that my least favorite um, line in a rejection letter is always not a good fit because it always makes me feel like I've been trying to put on skinny jeans or something and like I have failed. It's not a good fit. So um, my essay in this book, which is wonderful, I love this book. I've been so enjoying reading through it and attending these events and getting to hear from others. So I'm excited to be here um, to share with you tonight. So my essay is called How to Network as a Poet. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the beginning and then I'll abridge each of my four sections um, for you a little bit and then I'll share my conclusion with you. How to Network as a Poet. I used to think that networking was just a scummy thing that business majors did. I thought it meant feigning interest in people because they might be able to help you somehow in the future. I was shocked to discover that networking doesn't have to be scummy and that I'd been accidentally networking as a poet all along. Writers always advise other writers to read a lot and write a lot but I would add that poets need to connect with other people who read, write, edit, and publish poetry, not because those people might help them, but for the sheer joy of connecting with others who do the same weird and wonderful thing. When you make these connections, a side effect will inevitably be that you will come across more opportunities as well. Here are a few ways to network as a poet. One, contact people whose work you admire. One of my favorite things about being in the world of poetry is that our rock stars are often accessible. We can find them online and send them messages and they will often write back. Of course, some of them won't, but in my experience, most do, and they're happy to hear that their work has reached someone. When I was a graduate student in Louisiana, I came across a poem in the Pedestal magazine that took off the top of my head. I read it again, then I read it again, then I thought, I have to find this poet and tell her how much I love this poem. I had never tracked down a poet like this before, but I searched online for Nikkel Davis and found her blog. I left a comment telling her that I loved that poem. She replied that my comment made her day. I invited her to submit to my school's literary journal, which I edited, and she did. Then she tracked me down at the book fair at the next AWP conference just to say hello and to thank me again for my encouragement. Then I moved to California after my PhD program ended, not too far from her, and I started teaching her book in my poetry classes. She came to talk to my students. The next time that she came to talk to my students, she and her son spent the night at my house. Then she taught my chapbook in her class, and I drove my very pregnant body through the mountains to meet with her students. Then she planned a wonderful event in Los Angeles, the Poetry Circus, and invited me to be a performer. Then I solicited one of Nikkel's poems that I'd heard and loved for the first issue of my newly created literary journal, Whale Road Review. 
Then I performed in another poetry circus, and I've met so many poets and publishers in Southern California because of those events. Then I moved down to San Diego and invited Nikkel to be the featured poet at my university's annual poetry day. I could go on and on, but you can see that what began with a blog comment, just because I loved somebody's poem, has grown wildly over the last several years into admiration for each other's work, shared opportunities, and friendship. I couldn't have known that all of this would follow my comment, and I didn't contact her because I wanted anything at all from her. I was just a reader who loved a poem and wanted the poet to know. My second idea for networking as a poet is to write reviews. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but the idea in this section that I think is probably most important um, is looking at different venues for reviews because there are a lot of different um, I would say different preferences for how reviews should be done. Some places like reviews that are um, a little bit more critical or that take a stance on the, the piece that's being reviewed. Some places like reviews that are more descriptive. And so getting a sense for what kind of review a place actually wants to publish is important. And I'll just read um, the last bit of this section. When you review poetry, you make connections with the poet, of course, with the publisher, with the magazine editor who publishes the review, and with the people who read the review. And those, um, those connections end up going farther than you can possibly trace. So I had a non-poet friend tell me that she had read one of the reviews that I had published. Um, it was a review of Lucy Shaw's Sea Glass that I had written that was published in the Crescent. Um, and she had read it uh, just via social media and ended up purchasing that book for a friend of hers. Um, and so I love that sense that when I write a review, I'm connecting in all of these different ways with all of these different people um, beyond my ability to trace, but it's, it's a, a cool way to connect. My third idea for networking as a poet um, is to edit or read for a journal. So there are so many literary magazines and journals that are, um, as Helen already said, running on love and <laughs> are inundated with submissions and might tell you a good sob story about it, but it's a thing. So um, there are so many opportunities to get involved. And so for poets who are wanting to get involved in some way, who are wanting to kind of see what that world is like from the other side, there are just tons of opportunities to be a reader. Um, and that's another great way uh, to make connections. So editing literary journals has connected me more widely to other people in the poetry world than anything else I've done. Since I started my own online literary journal, I've connected with so many of our authors on social media. Initially, we make this digital connection so I can tag them and promote their piece that we've published. But beyond that, I also promote their future publications and clever posts. I end up seeing or hearing about kids, jobs, trips, and more. And then I get many of our contributors, um, I get to meet them in person at conferences and workshops. And as if it weren't rewarding enough to read and share wonderful writing, sometimes this act of networking also results in dear friendships. My fourth idea for networking as a poet is to attend readings and conferences and workshops, which looks a little bit different currently. Um, but my main idea in this section is actually that you don't have to just go to the big ticket kinds of workshops and conferences um, that cost a lot of money and that are prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, a lot of places do have a local scene that you can find, but if you're in a place that does not have some kind of local poetry scene, um, then there are a lot of opportunities online and oh my goodness, even more so now that we are, you know, all online. So um, there are just a lot of opportunities to connect with people through readings and workshops. And it's a good way um, to, to meet your people. To, and I, I think of it that way when I have gone to workshops and I've found those people who are doing this strange thing that I do and who are interested in the kinds of things that I'm interested in. It's such a relief and it's such a gift to be with those kinds of people. So my conclusion. Where I tell, where I undo some of the stuff that I just did. Um, I certainly don't want to suggest that the world of poetry is idyllic. As with any field, there are some hyper-competitive and selfish people. 
There are some writers, editors, publishers, and organizations that seem to thrive on conflict and chaos. There are workshops and events that feel more cutthroat than supportive. There are also people who only want to self-promote and don't care at all about connecting with others. As just one example, some people perform at events or read at conferences and then leave without watching anyone else. We don't have to be those people. We can be good readers and listeners. We can celebrate each other's achievements. We can be kind and connect with each other for the pleasure of camaraderie. When you network like this, you might find, as I have, that the relationships are the best part of this poetry world and any opportunities that come your way as a result of those connections are a nice bonus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and again, I, I, I won't try to dive in as an editor too much, but um, one thing that I will say, um, especially about your point about writing reviews, is that um, that can be a great way to sort of support your poetry habit. Um, you know, poetry doesn't, it, poetry rarely pays anything, to be quite honest, right? Um, but, uh, you know, publishers like like me, um, if somebody emails me and even says, hey, I have my own private book blog, or I have a YouTube channel where I post reviews of all the books that I like, and I'm interested in, I send reviews to those people anytime, review copies to those people anytime they ask. Um, so being a reviewer is a great way just to get some really great poetry in your hands without paying for it. So um, that's another little point that I'll add in there. Um, we also um, we also have uh, Linda and Nancy. Is anybody really excited about being third in the lineup tonight? Linda or Nancy? Linda? Okay, there we go. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Linda Simone, the author of The River Will Save Us, Archaeology, the award-winning Cow Tippers, and Moon, a Poem. Her essays and pushcart nominated poems appear in print and online journals and anthologies. She is honored to be one of the 30 poets selected for San Antonio's 2018 Tricentennial Chapbook and Exhibition. New York born and bred, Simone relocated to San Antonio in 2015. Um, welcome. Thank you. And I hope you're not hearing these little things that are coming up on my computer. I apologize if you are. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about when that particular moment when a poem or an idea for a poem kind of implants into your head, right? There's two ways that this can play out. One is that the poem can be born fully formed like Athena out of the head of Zeus, or um, there could be a real struggle trying to get the poem out. Uh, and that's kind of what my essay was about. Uh, it was a poem, it was a persona poem that I decided to write about a woman by the name of Miyoshi Jingu, okay? So I'm gonna read a little bit and then I'm gonna talk in between. Um, the title of the essay is The Stubborn Poem, Tackle or Trash. While touring San Antonio's Japanese tea garden, I learned about a woman who in the early 20th century migrated with her family from Japan to California to the Alamo City. She had once run the garden's bamboo tea room. As a recent San Antonio transplant myself, I wondered if she too found it hard to understand a new culture, to make new friends, and feel a part of the community. I was inspired to explore her life in a poem in her voice. I let the idea simmer until I saw a call for submissions for an anthology of Southwestern persona poems. Ah, the perfect home, I thought, for the poem I had yet to start. Beginning was the first hurdle. So the next step in this process was doing a lot of research because the only thing I knew about Miyoshi Jingu were these two lines that were written in the brochure for the Japanese tea house, tea garden restaurant. But they, there was enough there that kind of sparked my interest. I did a lot of research. I went online. I tried to read about the family that lived there. Um, I went to the San Antonio uh, library. They have a special area called the um, 
Texana and genealogy reference desk and I went to them and I just kept building up every, more and more information about this woman that I was trying to learn who she was. Um, so finally, uh, within this is a big thing that I learned and this is kind of what really piqued my interest. Within 15 years of the family uh, working and living at the Japanese tea garden, the family once called a unique asset of the city of San Antonio by the San Antonio Express News was deemed enemy aliens and forced out of their beloved home. This of course came right after Pearl Harbor. And I just couldn't imagine going from being the city's unique asset and, and ha they went to represent the city at the Chicago World Fair and they were just a beloved family. Uh, and then the next day, you know, they're being kicked out of their home. That just really got me and I had to, I just had to explore this further. Um, so I had all these facts in mind and in hand and um, what was I going to do with all of them, right? So I started to write drafts and with so many intriguing details, the poem was quickly shaping to become an epic. In early revisions, I moved lines, I shortened phrases, I added and deleted details, but what looked back at me from the page was hardly a poem at all. It just seemed like an endless list that read more like a historical essay broken into lines. Um, of course, my husband's my first reader and I read it to him and he kind of was like, oh, it doesn't sound like a poem, right? Uh, and then um, I have a group of uh, girlfriends who are, uh, we're a writing group or group of friends and we always have a writer's retreat every year. And so I decided to be brave and bring it to the retreat and read it to my good close friends who are all writers. Um, so their initial silence told me that I had much work to do. My friend Terry said to focus on the seminal moment in Miyoshi's life rather than to try to tell her whole story. Anne suggested internalizing Miyoshi's struggle. How would I feel if I were evicted from the home I loved? I knew everything they said was right, but how to fix? That was a hurdle yet to clear. So my friend Sarah, um, when we were at this retreat, this annual retreat, was bra uh, bragging about this masterclass that she had just taken and how it had totally given her a whole new outlook on something that she was working on and let her really turn a corner. So I thought, well, maybe I need a poetry workshop. I hadn't taken one in quite a while, so maybe I needed one. So the local writing venue, Gemini Inc., was serendipitously offering a persona poem workshop. Was this luck or karma? My friends wisely advised not to bring the current draft, but just to go and simply absorb what the class had to offer, which is what I did. Uh, the poet who taught this class was Khadijah Queen. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she gave us exercises and she gave us sample poems. And it was very, very helpful uh, to just hear how other people treated the persona poem. And then finally, I asked her advice on getting unstuck when working on a poem. She echoed my friend's counsel. Don't tell too much and find a moment when your subject is faced with a pivotal decision. Okay, so I had a plan. So there were several, several versions, version upon version, and I would write and I would add things, I would subtract things, and then I would started to put it away for a while so that I could pick it up again and look at this poem with fresh eyes because I, I just couldn't even see it anymore. Uh, and finally, um, I was about to abandon the whole idea, chalking it up to an exercise in self-flagellation when I learned that U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera was speaking at a local college. Juan was authentic, funny, and encouraging. And I got a chance to go up to him at the end and I asked him, you know, what he did when he got stuck on a poem. Put it away and try writing about Anything else, a leaf, a pencil, just write, he said. Ditch the beginning and end, and you'll be left with the pineapple. And if all else fails, write it backwards. The pineapple, that was a new one on me. So I continued more revisions, tried to listen to everybody's advice, 
Um, and at this point, um, whether or not the anthology that I was going to be submitting to actually accepted this poem was a moot point. This was a battle between me and myself, whether I could conquer this poem or not. I mean, I just, I had put so much time into it, so much effort into it, and darn it, I was going to make this thing work. So, um, finally, a full 25 revisions later from where I started, uh, I, I actually liked where the poem had landed and I respected the journey. So two weeks before deadline, I screwed my courage to the sticking place and I hit submit. It felt amazing to have worked through barriers of crafting and self-doubt to meet the challenges of an idea that wouldn't give up on me, aided by people who never give up on me. Miyoshi Jingu, the woman that I wrote about, was strong. Even after her husband's untimely death, she continued to successfully run the tea house while rearing her eight children. She responded to prejudice with dignity and forgiveness, and in the end, triumphed. Writing in what I imagined to be her voice made me stronger too. The following month, Dos Gatos Press accepted my poem, Tea House of the Texas Moon. I was beyond ecstatic, partly because the acceptance validated all the hard lessons learned through six months of revisions, but mostly because Miyoshi Jingu's story deserved to be told. The anthology, which is titled Bearing the Mask, sits prominently on my bookshelf as if a reminder that an idea that wriggles into your brain provides an invaluable opportunity to work and grow, create and polish, and make something you're proud of. So that was the story of this poem that I struggled with for a long time. And kind of one of the benefits uh, that came out of this was after I finally was happy with the poem and I knew it was going to be published, I tried to see if any of the Jingu family were still around. I knew that from my research that they had moved from San Antonio finally after all that happened. And I think they moved actually in the 1950s to the West Coast. And I, there was one of the kids, uh, one of Miyoshi's children in particular, who always was a favorite with me. Her name was Mabel. And she just was a pip. She, she did all these like funny things. And I just, I loved her. I didn't even know her, but I loved her. I happened to, to find someone that I thought might have been her daughter. And I wrote to her on social media and I explained that I had written a poem about her grandmother and I had done some research about the family. And I kind of felt like a stalker. I was like, this woman is going to think I'm a lunatic. But she got back to me and we've had a, a long distance friendship ever since. So a lot came out of it. And yes, the literary community in, in this instance was, was broad. It was my friends, it was my family, but it also were, uh, were poetry uh, teachers, the writing uh, organization, Gemini Inc., the, the poet laureate of the United States, all of these people helped me in one way or another uh, be able to create a successful poem. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that, that's just wonderful. And what a sweet victory after so much work. Um, I also think it's a great example of how hard, you know, so many people toil and toil and toil away. Um, and they just only ever kind of use themselves as as uh, as an editor um, and you had this these wonderful experiences of connecting with the poet laureate and Khadija queen and um and and your friends and and trusted uh trusted readers um to to bring the poem into the world as it finally was in into an anthology that you're so proud of that has a wonderful place on your bookshelf i just love that story i love it thank so much. you thank you for sharing it with us i really thank you um 
Next and last for the evening, which is appropriate because Nancy, your essay is the last in this section about the literary community. Um, we have Nancy Reddy, um, little shout out fellow Pittsburgh girl. <laughs> um, Nancy is the author of Double Jinx from Milkweed Editions, a 2014 winner of the National Poetry Series. Congratulations. And even bigger congratulations for this, Akadiana uh, from Black Lawrence Press. <laughs> <laughs> uh, poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Pleiades, Blackbird, the Iowa Review, Smartish Pace, and elsewhere. The recipient of a Walker, uh, sorry, a Walter E. Dakin Fellowship from the Swanee Writers Conference and grants from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the Sustainable Arts Foundation. She teaches writing at Stockton University in Southern New Jersey. Welcome, Nancy. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with you all. As other people have said, I feel like one of the really lovely things um, this is going to feel weird to say, but one of the lovely things about this world we're in now is being able to do events like this um, with like several of you that I've emailed with a lot or talked to on Twitter and here we are together in this virtual world. Um, so I will try to be quick because I want to make sure there's space for conversation. Um, there's a lot of connections between my piece and the anthology and um, what everyone else has said. My essay came out of the experience of um, starting my MFA and um, starting to send out my own poems kind of seriously for the first time. At the same time as I was a screener for a book prize that my, that my program ran. And so I was like trying so hard to find my own place in the world and feeling kind of scared in a workshop and getting like rejections all the time as Helen was saying, like so many rejections. Um, and then also I think it was one of the last years that there were mailed manuscripts. So we would get these, these big boxes full of manuscripts and um, you could only, out of each box of 40, um, you could only move on four of them. And so it really was this like weight of almost all of the manuscripts were at least good. Um, and so it was really hard to um, decide sometimes what to pass along and you could tell how much work had gone into them and how much labor. Um, and it made me think about my own poor poems like out there in the world trying to like pull themselves up out of the you know slush pile um but i think it really helped me to think about um submission as not being this kind of like sharp elbowed like beat everyone else down kind of a journey which i think is probably how i started thinking about it like i just have to be better than everyone else um, and I think through reading um, those submissions and then also through starting a literary magazine with my MFA um, cohort, I was able to think about um, publication as a kind of way of building community. Like when you've sent your poems out into the world, someone is reading them and they might hate them, they might, um, or they might like them, but not enough to publish them, or they might love them, but like you have a reader in a way that you don't if you just kind of keep it to yourself. Um, and so the, the kind of overall point that I was trying to make in the essay is this idea that um, if you want to send out your own work, if you're trying to like take up space in a literary community, which I think you should, right? Like I think everyone should, it's part of the kind of ecosystem of writing. Um, you should also look for ways to make space for other people. Um, and I gave some of the suggestions that other people have given too. Katie talked about reviewing. Um, I really love doing interviews because I love having a chance to talk to someone whose book that I love about their book. And it's a great way to get free books, as um, Diane was saying, like it stunned me in the first year of my MFA that I could just go to like Tupelo's table at AWP and say like, hey, I really love this book. And we wrote a review of it and they remembered my name and they were like, here, do you want any other books? It was great. Um, and um, you can also do things like just sharing works that you like on Twitter or Facebook or whatever else. Um, I talked about like requesting books to the library. I think we don't always have the money to buy all of the books that we want to buy, but I'm always like telling my local library and my university library to buy things. Um, so there are ways of supporting work, even if you, um, th that aren't just about spending money. Um, so I will stop there with the kind of big idea about like trying to make space for other people's um, writing at the same time as you're trying to 
enter that space yourself because I hope that we can have um, some conversation and, and continue some of the conversation that started in the chat. Thank you so much, Nancy. So um, I will go to the top uh, here of the chat. And um, we have a question from Darby Price for all the panelists. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is specifically to Linda, but I think all the panelists can respond. How do you know when you've written a real poem, quotes around real, um, and then a bio followed up with how do you know when a poem is ready? How do you know when the poem is real and how do you know when the poem is ready? Big questions, who wants to jump in? Nancy, do you wanna go first? Sure, I'll start since I'm already unmuted. I mean, I really liked what Linda was saying or what Linda was kind of hinting at, which is having a um, artificial deadlines, or, or, or I guess they're real deadlines, um, but um, as a way of forcing yourself to um, send something, like you wanted to submit to that anthology, so you had to have something by whatever that date was. And I think just saying, on a calendar kind of basis, like a whole bunch of literary magazines tend to open up like September 1st, September 15th, October 1st, I have it all in my spreadsheet. Um, and so at that point, I usually just kind of say like, what do I have? What's what what do I have that I feel like I can send out? Let's see what happens. Um, which is not to say that I just kind of throw out any like scrap of paper that I've like typed up and like send it to, you know, the Kenyan review or whatever in the two weeks they read a year. Um, but I think sometimes you don't know until you've tried. And I know that I've had the experience of sending out a packet of like five poems. And sometimes the one that I feel like, oh, it's a little weird. I don't know how I feel about that ends up being the one that gets taken because it's weird in a way that someone else responds to. Um, so I don't know. I guess I would say, like, I think it's really useful to just decide you're going to do it. Um, I keep a spreadsheet. And I've kept it for years and years of, um, you know, places I want to send to. I add to it when I find magazines on Twitter or wherever that I like. Um, and then set a goal of like, okay, this week I'm going to send to 10 places. And I just kind of send and see what happens. Well, I'll jump in here too. Um, I think that I think Darby's question actually was twofold. So he was talking about the sound of a poem and also about when you know whether what you've written is real. So first of all, the sound, I, I mean, part of the reason why when I started with this poem, it sounded more like an essay or a historical list. It just, it didn't have that music that poetry, we all know poetry does. You know, whether it's assonance, whether it's internal rhyme, I mean, you need these things in a, in a good poem, and it wasn't there. So I needed to keep working it until it got there slowly but surely. But also, you know, when a poem uh, is real or not. Um, I mean, in my case, I had trusted listeners who I did trust their opinions, and, it, and just the fact that reading it to my girlfriends and there was dead silence, I was like, whoa. Oh. This is not ready, you know, and, and also I have to say that if you look inside yourself, you know, you kind of know when you think something is your best work or not, you, you know, like you're, you may want it to be done, but you know it's not done yet and you know that there are more revisions in your future. So, you know, you just got to keep working on it. And finally, the, the final test is reading it out loud to yourself and listening. And you can hear if you're stumbling over lines, if if it just doesn't ring true, it's not. So got to keep working on it. <laughs> I read aloud to myself constantly as I'm drafting, and that's, that's how I can figure out if something is working. Um, and I would echo that I also run my poems by other people as often as I can, um, because I feel like I'm often the worst evaluator of my own work. I'm pretty good at evaluating other people's work or at letting them know, ah, it's not quite working in this line. Um, but it's hard to do that for myself. So it's part of why we need each other. And I, I think I've sort of given up the idea of, um, I think I used to be really interested in this idea of, is this poem done? Like, is it finished? And I, I just don't care about that as much anymore. <laughs> um, so, so I think I've come to a place of sometimes poems are ready for now and I'll send it out and, and it might get published that way. And I might revise that poem wildly before it goes into a book. 
-hmm. or before it goes into an anthology or before I read it again <laughs> to someone. Um, and that's okay. I think poems can live in different drafts and different versions. Um, and sometimes a poem that was ready for me at, at one point, I, I need to make it different in the future, maybe because I'm a different person or I hopefully I've gained some poetry skills as I go along and I'm ready to make it better. And this is one thing where I think um, you were talking about being it being an editor like I think that reading for a literary magazine can be really helpful because I know that as a as a reader. Um, you, you can kind of spot when someone is up to a trick like eh, that's not you didn't that didn't that poem doesn't work you didn't do that like you're being clever there but it doesn't really um hang together i feel like it i feel like reading um reading submissions has helped me to be a more critical reader in ways that i can take back into my own work and i'll think like eh, if i saw that in the slush pile i would know like that's a that's a kind of cheater ending um and i think also the conversations if you're reading with other people the conversations that you have about the writing can be really informative as well for a while i read for devil's lake with um rebecca hazelton who's an incredibly if you don't know her work an incredibly smart just like no nonsense reader she'd be like that metaphor doesn't make sense without da, 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 da. and i feel like i now have like that voice in in my head a little bit with my own writing in a really good way um and so that, like, those editorial relationships have helped me, I think, have a better editorial eye for my own writing. I think also, Nancy, you make a point when you just said that you had her voice in your head. Um, it's also interesting to have our own voices in our head, because sometimes we don't actually know what our voices are. We're writing, and we're, you know, we're putting words down, but after a while you have to kind of recognize what your voice is and sometimes a trusted listener will help you through that process I, i've had people tell me oh wow you you know your theme is this and i was like it was i mean i had no idea i was writing about that but um you know it's just i, I agree with you nancy thank you all so much for those responses and we have another question from sam del rey um, what are ways that you can stay true to your own writing style or voice when you are constantly reading so many other works from other people? Great question, Sam. I actually love, I love this question. Um, and I actually really love um, like kind of intentional um, Imitation, I guess, if that's a way to say it. I was just reading something the other day about um, like imitation and art, right? That people learn to learn to draw by like copying intentionally and then you do it badly and then you mess it up and then you learn your own weird way. And I feel like that can be really helpful. Like there have been times, especially if I have been kind of stuck in my writing and I didn't know what I wanted to do, where I would like write out a poem and then try to um, by someone else and then try to copy kind of like phrase for phrase, like to make a new poem out of that, if that makes sense. It, it's, I found that really for a while, I was doing it with Carl Phillips, which is really hard um, because his syntax is so wacky, but it really helped me to think about his poems in a good way. Um, and so I actually feel like that kind of imitation can be helpful in thinking about your own voice and also maybe pushing what you think your own voice is. Um, I'm also a little suspicious of like one true voice in part maybe because I feel like there's a handful of poets, and I won't name names, but who have written the same book maybe four or five times now. And I kind of feel like, I mean, you found your voice and it was successful and then you kept going with it. And that's not, that's not who I want to be. I know at one point in um, one of the essays in the Louise Glick's um, Proofs and Theories, she talks about after she finished each book, making new rules for herself about what she would do in the next one um, and things like, um, not writing in complete sentences or using questions or not using um, first person as a way of kind of saying, what are my habits? What am I breaking? And so that's one thing that I think can be useful as well as to like actually print out and look at a bunch of your work and say kind of like, what are the habits here? What are the things that I think feel true to me, right? Like there are weird things I do in writing that are part of who I am. Um, but what are the tricks that I'm using? Am I, am I, I really loved second person for a while and then I had to be like Nancy cool it. Um, so I think looking at your own work and trying to distinguish between like voice and trick and then maybe making some rules for yourself and playing with that can be useful. 
I think also, um, Nancy, like you mentioned, copying a poem out, and I think that's a great idea. Um, also, you probably, many of you have done the exercise of taking a, a poem that's in a, a, a language that you have no idea what it says and trying to translate it. And basically you're translating what like a word might sound like. And it's a, it's a very interesting way to get your take on and, and go somewhere where you may never have gone with the poem. So it's just, it's a fun exercise. I, I also love this question, and I, I think I, I didn't realize until maybe just now that this is something that I used to worry about and I don't anymore. <laughs> so I like, I like having this sort of epiphany moment in this, in this room with you all. Um, I, think, I think I used to worry that I wouldn't find my own voice or develop my own style, and, and at some point, I guess maybe it's kind of like what Nancy was saying, I think. At some point, I have written enough and I find myself almost writing away from what I've done before. Like I've done this and now I want to do something else and now I want to I want to do some research and I want to go over here. And so it's never about trying to hold on to like what is my voice. Um, I'm not going to be able to get away from the things that I care about and the things that are my concerns and my interests and um, I don't know. So, so there's something that is my voice that's going to permeate my work, but I, I'm not trying to hold on to anything. I'm always reaching for what is this next thing that I'm going to learn and what is this next project that I'm going to pursue. Um, and so I don't worry too much about, I mean, I, I read pretty wildly and have so much input that I've, I've never been concerned um, in reading for journals at least that I'm going to imitate somebody specifically or that I'm going to take on somebody else's voice. Um, and I, I think maybe because the, the voices are too, too plentiful and too cacophonous that <laughs> that, that wouldn't be a concern. Um, but I really, I love that question and I appreciate you bringing that up again, Sam. I haven't thought about it in a while. Yes, thank you so much, Sam. And we have one from a bio uh, question. A popular sentiment is that it takes a first book of poems 10 years to be ready to go out into the world. Is there some truth to this? How soon should a poet send a manuscript into the world? Well, I don't know that there's a timeline. <laughs> um, I think it's when you feel that your manuscript is ready, when you're able to look at a whole bunch of poems. And one of the hardest things I find is to actually put your poems in some kind of logical order. It's stressful to do that, to figure out what the sections are, to figure out what, what poems should come after or before another one. But I think, you know, once you, you have what you think is a collection and you, you can kind of make some sort of sense out of it, um, I think it's ready, whether it's 10 years or two years. I think a lot about this. I, I um, love thinking about like what makes a book a book. Um, and for me, I think I, I want a book that is like in my own reading and my own writing, a book that does something more than just kind of put a bunch of poems next to each other, if that makes sense. And so I think there has to be, um, in order for it to be ready to be a book, there has to be something that binds the, that binds the poems together. And it, ideally not something like, here's 50 poems about motels, um, but some way in which the poems are speaking to um, each other, um, perhaps like, perhaps across content, but maybe also across form, um, across images, those kinds of things. And I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not, but I think there is a sense that like, the what's and this is the kind of thing that I can never I can't source it but something like in an album of 12 songs the 13th is the album does that make sense like it has to the the book is something more than just the poems and that I think is a um it can be a hard thing to figure out I think especially because I think writing a book is really hard like you have to write a whole bunch of different poems and you have to make each poem really good and then you have to put them together in a way that it doesn't think it's really hard um mm -hmm. 
I'll stop there. I don't know. I love I love thinking about it, and I love books that really feel like a kind of deliberate world. And so maybe that's one way of getting at an answer is to think like, what are the books that you love the most? Like not just poems, but what are the books that you love the most? And what do those show you about like what you want your book to do? I have to say Nancy, too, I, oh. I'm, I'm sorry, Abayo, just I want to say that my first book of poem, because you're talking about first book of poems, was is yet to be published actually it's the one that i've been working on for such a long time and it doesn't feel ready my second book of poems has been published i was fortunate to have that one published but the one that i started out thinking was going to be my first book of poems it's still being worked on that's a good point linda i think my my first manuscript that was a full-length manuscript is still unpublished too but my first full length manuscript that was published, um, that, that was when I finally kind of figured out as I was gathering that manuscript and I took it through so many iterations of organizing the poems. Um, but it was that moment, kind of like Nancy was saying, where I figured out that the book is a poem. <laughs> like yes. it's just zooming out and seeing it as a big poem. And that was just, I mean, I feel like I had read so many things and I had listened to people, but I, it's, it's kind of like having a child and you can't really believe it until you actually have this thing depending on you for 24 hours a day. Like, I, I didn't believe it until I had this book in front of me. <laughs> and then I went, oh, the book is a poem and it's okay to leave, like it's okay to cut poems out and like you would cut a line. And it might make it better, even though that poem was supposed to be here, like you thought it was supposed to be. It's okay. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think it does take a lot of time. And part of it is that you just have no, especially, I think, especially with a first book or as you're figuring out how to put a manuscript together for the first time, it takes some time to figure out how do these pieces go together and how do I zoom out from that poem level to that book manuscript level? Um, I had a hard time zooming out. It's, it's still hard. I think it's hard with every manuscript to. Yeah. I don't think it gets, I don't think it gets easier. I finished a book and then I was like, oh, am I supposed to write another one? I don't know if I know how to do that. Like, I don't know if I know how to write a poem. <laughs> I wrote one thing and what happens now. Um, one thing that I think can be really helpful, like this is why you see people print out their work and like tape it to the wall. I like, like painter's tape or spread it out. I do think you need to really see it and kind of be like, be able to be in the presence of your, of your work um to see what the connections are and to be able to move things around and also i think to see gaps to see like oh i've talked about this thing and this thing but there's this other thing that connects them that i actually haven't written yet um and i think also that actually just looking at your table of contents can be helpful too as a way of thinking about um what are these poems doing like what are they signaling about how they relate to each other um i really like I think it can be, I think usually we, um, because there's this idea that it takes so long to write a book and it takes forever to get published. And I know in my MFA, they were like, oh, your, your thesis is not a book. It's not a book, it's not a book. And I was like, okay, that's fine, I get that. But like, how do I make it be a book? Like how? Um, and I never got an answer to that. And which is fine, it's an unanswerable question. Um, but I think there's such an emphasis on how long it takes that I think we miss the fact that you can start thinking about your work as a book um, before you have like 48 pages. I think it actually can be helpful when you have maybe like 20 pages to put them next to each other and say like, what's happening here? What are the connections? Um, and because that can be really generative um, as a way of saying like, oh, here's a technique I'm using. What if I do that three more times? What if I write four more poems on this topic? Um, and you can kind of like shape the manuscript as you go rather than printing out like 80 pages and trying to jigsaw it together, if that makes sense. I often see those um, thesis manuscripts that, you know, the, the, the writers were told this isn't a book come across my desk. Um, because so often, you know, people will say directly in their cover letters, this was my thesis as I was graduating from such and such a program. And so it's, it's interesting. I've noticed, again, I'm chiming in as an editor here. Um, hopefully I'm 
offering some useful insight. But um, if somebody just graduated, um, and of course, I won't let this bias. I'll, I'll read the manuscript, you know, on its own terms. But um, it's it's less likely that it's really ready than somebody who's maybe four or five years out, um, who has spent some time, stepped back, they've gotten out of the you know MFA or PhD rhythm and back into the rhythm of the real world. Um, and it's much more common that those manuscripts are ready to go. How can you tell? Are there things in a manuscript where you're like, oh, this was a thesis? I'm curious about this from the editorial perspective. Um, well, I think that the only reason I really know is people will say in their cover letters, this was my thesis at such and such a program. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I mean, everybody here would pick up, you know, a book versus a manuscript and say, okay, these are poems that don't necessarily belong to each other even if they are in the same voice or have something to do with the same topic versus, um, you know, this is, this is a book length poem, as we, as we just mentioned, right? This has an arc, this has a shape, these belong to each other. There's um, a conversation from poem to poem to poem um, instead of just, and I see the same thing to, um, by the way, when people submit short story collections, um, it's, it's, it's quite similar. These are just 10 great short stories that you wrote in your master's program versus um, these are 10 great short stories that are talking to each other that belong together that should be between two covers on a bookshelf. Sorry for hijacking the conversation <laughs> again. I really just like to talk about my work. <laughs> um, I think that's it for the, um, the sidebar questions we've had in the chat. We're a pretty small group here right now. We're down to 11 people. I know a couple of people had to bow out for other commitments. Um, I know everybody has very busy Zoom agendas these days. Um, I'm happy to kind of just unmute everybody and have a little free-for-all conversation before we say goodnight, unless anybody has one last specific question they'd like our panelists to address. Nope. Okay, here we go. Um, hold on. How do I, I think, is there a way to just unmute everybody? I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> okay. Also, if anybody has like a really cute cat hiding in their lap, I would love to see. That's one of my favorite things that happens at the end of Zoom calls is when the pets show up. <laughs> Diane, I have a follow-up question. I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. It's just so wonderful to hear the essays and your voices. It's just so, these essays are just so wonderful. I keep saying session, after session mm -hmm. that I wish that I had read these essays when I was starting out. I started out so much on the wrong foot. I just, I felt like I knew what poetry was. Oh, there's a lovely cat. Thank oh you. Oh my gosh, Sam, what do you have? Is it a puppy? This oh, is baby. A baby. It's so a baby. <laughs> oh my God, it's a kitten. I'm so sorry to interrupt. You keep going. Oh, no, Very no. specifically asked for that. Yeah. <laughs> he was abandoned by his mom next to our house. Yeah. And so we just rescued him last week and we officially had him. I think this is our eighth day with him. Oh, so the great. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, a bio, you were saying. Okay. Yes, I was just going to say that, you know, um, the, the, the essays are just so wonderful, so lovely, so full of heart that I wish that, I keep saying it session after session, that I wish I had I'd read these essays, not by people from before that I may be feeling like, all right, all right, they're so far away from me, they don't know what I'm going through, but contemporaries, mm -hmm. people around me that something about it makes me feel as if I'm not in it alone, that mm -hmm. the questions are, I have are not unique to me in any way, that it's okay for me to stumble. It's okay for me not to know. Nobody has it all figured out. That's a big relief for me that, oh, I don't have to put on an act. I don't have to look a certain way or dress a certain way or sound a certain way to be a poet. It's okay for me to just stumble through it and have something along the way. So it's just been so wonderful reading these essays in so many ways. But all right, 
long preamble to my questions. I have a two part question here. We've been talking about publication and rejections and all these things. And so my question is this, when is rejection helpful to a mm. poet? And so part two is, can acceptances be detrimental to a poet? And now I'll mute mm. myself. I love that question. I, the first thing to my mind is I got the most helpful rejection on my full-length poetry manuscript, um, and, and they gave me some specific feedback, and it was so painful, yes. but it was so valuable, mm -hmm. and so it was, um, and I, I've talked about this and, and written about it a little bit publicly, but Sundress Publications um, they first they asked me if I wanted the feedback, which I thought was lovely, and I did want the feedback. And so they sent me the specific feedback, and it included these are the poems that we felt were the strongest in this manuscript, and these are the poems that we felt were the weakest in this manuscript. And it was like gut punch. And they um, told me about you know some of the things that weren't working well with the organization of the manuscript, with some specific suggestions for how I might rethink the organization. And so I like put that aside for a little bit and, you know, licked my wounds. Um, and when I came back to it and really dug into that feedback and I revamped my manuscript for like the, you know, who knows how many th time, um, when I sent that manuscript out the next time, the first place I sent it, I, I sent it to a few places, but the first one that I sent it after that overhaul was where I won the mm -hmm. book award. Um, and so that rejection was, I mean, it was the best thing that could have possibly happened to that manuscript. And I knew after I had done that work and after I had taken that feedback seriously, I knew that I had this manuscript that was so much stronger than what I had before. So I'm so grateful. I thanked them in the, in the acknowledgement of thank you for this amazing rejection with feedback that I desperately needed. There are great press and great, um, great folks. I don't know if you all know Sundress. They do like a million things and they're so lovely. And they have a great write, like writing residency that I went to. And we have you yeah. ever been to Katie? It's like a farm in Tennessee and there's like chickens and goats and things. If you don't know, they're lovely. Yeah, they're so yeah. great. I think I that I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Who is, <laughs> well, I had a poem once that I attached to the back of an essay and they they accepted the essay without any problem. And then when I got the poem back, it was like they took a meat cleaver to it. And it was just it was just so jarring and, and upsetting. And I had to I had to back off from it for a while and mm -hmm. I made a few little tweaks and let it I just said, Go, go ahead, whatever. But now when I read that poem, I think, Oh yeah, that's that's the way it should be. You know, it's so it it it's it's I'm very surprised at how I have changed my opinion to the meat cleaver <laughs> that to it because it's still the same poem, but I like it now. I mean, it, it seems to me like that's the way it should have been, and yet it's so different. So, so I'm saying, I mean, and, and most editors don't do that, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. why, but it was beneficial to have that process that somebody else went through. Usually I don't, I don't get that. Mm -hmm. Just experience. Uh, and so, uh, I, I would say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead, Linda. No, I just would say that I'd have to, in my opinion, you almost learn more from rejections than you do from acceptances. Acceptances are great and they, mm -hmm. you know, they validate you and you feel wonderful about it and you can't wait to tell your friends and, you know, but when you get a rejection where an editor actually gives you feedback like that's, like what you had that's that's a great i mean that's a great experience a learning experience and even though it's hard to accept sometime in the beginning when you put it aside for a while and like Dwayne, if you you know you look at it again and you say oh, well let me give it a shot um i think that's that's where you really can learn when you get the the feedback where there's no feedback no yeah yeah. No help whatsoever. And like somebody said, it doesn't fit. What do you mean it doesn't fit? Doesn't fit. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. excuse me. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> anyway. 
Okay. One thing I would say on, on the kind of like flip side of it is that um, it's been really important for me at like various parts in my writing life to remember that um, being published doesn't have anything to do the, the relationship between being published and being a writer is not one-to-one, -one, if that makes sense. Like, nobody gets to say that you're a writer other than you. Like, every editor in the world can reject you, and that doesn't make you not a writer. And sometimes um, that feels a little, like, glib to say, maybe, but I think it's, but I think it's important. And there have been times when it's been really hard for me to feel that way, right? Like, especially times when I could see people in my MFA program getting published, and I was like, I just got rejected from that journal. Why doesn't anyone think that I'm good? Like, um, that, like, you writing is the thing that makes you a writer. Publication is kind of the like business side of things and it can be the the relationship side of things um, and rejection can teach you a lot and sometimes it means the work isn't ready. Sometimes you haven't found the right home for it yet um, but it doesn't it doesn't make you a, and being published doesn't make you a writer either like it doesn't actually I don't know I've published in some places that I'm proud of and sometimes I still feel like a fraud so you know, I think that like it's important to remember um, to have a sense of yourself as a writer and valuing your work and valuing your practice that's distinct from um, like being able to put nice things in your bio or like show a poem on Facebook or whatever your markers are. Thank you for those responses. And a bios, the second part of his question was, are there times when acceptances can be harmful? Um, any thoughts on that? Can't think of one where okay, I can't think of one. Like, you know, let's run with it. There's a projection in the world of IO. Let's not uh, let's not look for it. Well, one thing, and again, editor's hat on. Um, there are times that I see manuscripts come across my desk, and I think this this writer, this manuscript is going to be great, but it's not there yet. And I kind of think that if I were to, I just had this, I had this sort of battle with myself over manuscript just this week from kind of a younger writer who has some very important things to say, but it's mm -hmm. just not crystallized yet. And I feel like if we were to publish this manuscript that they sent, um, we would be doing a disservice because it's not where it's supposed to be yet. It, it could be really great and really important um, as a book, but um, it's not fully realized. So that that's, I, I do think that in some cases it's possible to publish too soon and have the author potentially regret that later on. Diane, I hope you gave that feedback to the writer because that would be really helpful. <laughs> It, it, I, it, it, I have to say, as an editor, again, sometimes you try and send um, those messages and you don't get a very nice response. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have to be really thoughtful about when I do and don't send those. And I'm still on the fence about this one. I think about that a lot as a journal editor, um, because there are times where I have feedback or one of the peer reviewers has given specific feedback and I have to weigh is is this worth trying to give this person feedback um is it is it worth the time is it worth the potential that this person will respond in a nasty or a negative way um, so if it's something that i think might be well received and that i think would really be valuable for the person i will ask if they want to receive some mm. feedback um, that we have from peer review. Which is, and, the, I suppose, the practice you learned from Sundress. Yeah, and I, I had done that before I actually got that from Sundress. So yeah, I think, I think there, are, there are enough of us who have learned that <laughs> as a, a, a little bit of a, I mean, I think it's twofold. Part of it is a defense mechanism. And I think especially for women editors, we tend to get more ire directed at us mm -hmm. if we um, respond to people in a way that's not positive. And, um, and I think part of it is being respectful. I don't, I don't think that my opinion is the be all end all of everything um, or that my peer reviewers opinions are everything. So I don't want to give writers the impression that like we have your answer and you know your your opinion is somehow lesser than ours. So um, so yeah so I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to force feedback on someone who doesn't want it. Um, and I have been in the position as a writer of receiving feedback from an editor um, that was really, really uh, condescending and awful and, and not um, something that I 
wanted. So, um, and I was a grad student at the time and it was very thoroughly awful. So, yeah. So I, I, I try not to do that to other people. Yeah. Is it okay if I add something to this conversation too? I just, I just love this conversation. So um, as, as you guys know, I was recently brought on as the anthology's editor for Black Lawrence. I was, while working on this anthology, I was brought on um, and just, just such a privilege. But now that I'm in the, I'm behind the scenes and seeing how things are going and I have to send out my own rejection letters, it's not fun for me to send out. <laughs> um, it's, especially when you, especially when you know you have this kind of small space to work with. Um, we can only accept one anthology per year. And this time around, this reading, this past um, open reading period, there were so many anthologies that I was just like, what do I do? It's just, there's just so many wonderful anthologies here. And writing those rejection letters, I felt like one of those editors that um, Helen Ruggieri was talking about, that you're almost apologizing so it's not, so this idea that editors just like to send our rejection letters, it's not always that, it's, that's not always true. Um, sometimes it's, it's difficult because they have to work with limited spaces, limited budget, and there's just so much. I'm gonna use the word talents because I can't find another word. There's so much vision. There's just so much ability out there and so many people committed to the craft who want to contribute to the conversation. And there's just so much you can do, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think as a writer, that can be really freeing to realize like how incredibly thin the editorial margin is. Like acceptance rates everywhere, like even at like, you know, small online only journals are in the single digits, like acceptance and usually low single digits. Um, and it takes, it's so hard for something to make it the whole way through the editorial process and get accepted that it's like a miracle. So like if something gets accepted, that's like the most thrilling thing. And if it doesn't, chances are it just like something at that, at that, you know, along the way, it's not a big deal. You know, it's like a, you didn't win the lottery today either. And your chances of that were probably about the same. And so I think it's, um, when you realize how like, how competitive it is, it can actually be very freeing to be like, oh, I didn't that didn't get accepted there. Let's try someplace else and see what see what happens, you know. And and it's very subjective. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, and this was one of the things like going back to reading those manuscripts. My 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 um one of my my colleagues um started a pile of um fig pit manuscript she had she kept coming up against um, manuscripts that had poems that mentioned fig pits in them which of course I don't think I knew this at the time but figs don't have pits um, <laughs> and it drove her crazy and there really were like four or five of them and I think after that like anything that had a fig in it made her mad anything that had a whatever you know and it was like but you don't know like ed editors have I mean editors have good reasons for rejecting things but sometimes they don't think that works like they've seen 10 poems about you know grackles and they don't want another one and that's not your fault but it's just is how it goes yeah one week I got a rejection of four po of a set of four poems and he said D more so less tell or something and then the very next day I got the same po four poems accepted for publication. These are wonderful. Da, 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 da. I thought, yeah, okay, I can get it. <laughs> so it helped me get that perspective that it's not really sometimes the poem. It's mm -hmm. the editor, it's it's what Yeah, it has to be this like incredible fit. Yeah. 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 And it's catching the right reader on the right day at the right yeah. moment in the, you know, I mean, it's, it is so, it is so yeah. much of a lottery. I like that. My yeah. friend Erin used to read for West Branch and she said like, you know, so much of it is like, did you catch the editor when they like really needed a cup of coffee? They were in like that part of the <laughs> afternoon where they, yeah. like, they weren't, you know, which is not to say, I mean, I don't actually think that editors are like capricious in their rejections, but I do think as a, as a writer, it can be helpful to remember that a rejection is not like a personal judgment on you and you're writing and should you keep writing and should you even bother doing this thing? Like, eh, you know, I can't sometimes stop. It I wasn't that not. moment, you know? Right. And so often it's more about catching, catching somebody and striking them. You know, if they're reading through hundreds of submissions, 
it's not that they're looking for what to reject. They're looking for that thing that like slaps them in the face. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're, you know, you are not receptive to being slapped in the face by a poem because you're exhausted or because you're thinking about something else. And so, yeah, editors are going to pass by something sometimes that they would at other times be wowed by um, because we're human. Right. I mean, I was just going to say, too, that there's definitely um, an element of luck to it, right? But what you want to do, I think the, the responsibility of the author, so we're talking about the, res the responsibility of the author to the literary community. You have to be a literary citizen, right? But what about the author's responsibility to his work? So mm. your job is to make the, uh, the, the editors the, um, give, let me see if I can rephrase this. Your job is to make the editor's job difficult, right? So that your everything is where it's supposed to be. So that even on a bad day and the editor is having a bad time, they pick up your work, they read the first poem, they're in a bad mood, they read the second poem, they're in the bad. By the time they get to the third poem, you've done enough for them to keep reading your work that now they're sitting down and then they mm. want to read more of your work, regardless of what they're, whatever they're going through, right? So I understand that there's an element of luck to it, but mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not all luck. There's, a, there's, there's craft, there's, there's, oh, yeah. there's work, there's time that needs to be invested in all these things too. And I like the idea of thinking about it as a responsibility to the work, because I feel like that suggests that it's not ego, right? It's not like, I want my name to be on a fancy place, like, but like, I'm, I'm working in this tradition, and I'm working, you know, hard on behalf of my craft, and I want to honor that as best as I can. Wonderful. This has all been so wonderful. And uh, our numbers are dwindling. I know people yeah. have to have to uh, finish up, uh, you know, spending time with us for the evening. Um, I did drop two things in the chat box. Uh, one is if you haven't yet uh, got a copy of Far Villages. Uh, it's the li a link to the book page. Plus, um, we're participating in the Brooklyn Book Fair virtually right now. And so with code BKBF, you can get 25% off Far Villages and any other in-print title um, on our list. Uh, so everything, basically everything except for the things that are currently forthcoming. Um, and then next Tuesday evening, we have J.G. McClure, Tannis McDonald, Christine Beck, Diana Rosen, and Aaron uh, Brown talking about about uh, the poet's journey. And I also dropped a link if you want to register for that, uh, that, that conversation next week. So um, thank you so much to our panelists. Oh, um, yes. Uh, yes. I have one question, Diane. So are these uh, going to be on, is it on your YouTube channel or? Yeah, because all of the recordings for all of our events will be in two places. They'll be on our YouTube channel, but they will also be on the Far Villages book page. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone so much. And of course, thank you to our wonderful anthologies editor, Abayo, who, as I said, was the brains and the heart behind this wonderful book. Um, and, uh, and I can't, honestly, I can't wait for your, everybody to find out about the next projects we have in store uh, under his guidance. We have some really great anthologies coming out. So um, thank you everybody. And I hope to see you next Tuesday night. Thank you.